Welcome back everybody for uh, this long session of today, Friday. Um, uh, we are now uh, streaming live on the YouTube channel. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to uh, have Vishwesha Guttal from the Indian Institute of Science uh, uh, to deliver a set of lectures. And uh, uh, the title of today's lecture is uh, um, Stochasticity and Bistability in Ecological Systems, uh, Part 1. Uh, so, uh, as always, you can uh, uh, raise your hand and uh, you can type your questions in the chat and uh, Vishwesh and myself will keep uh, an eye on it. Uh, uh, and then, uh, depending on, uh, uh, on how this question wants to deal with that, we, you can answer immediately or at the end uh, of the lecture. Okay. So with that, I leave you the floor. Looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, delivering these uh, talks at an ICTP meeting. Um, I was very much hoping to visit ICTP, but unfortunately, as you all know, <laughs> everything is uh, virtual uh, these days. The last time, uh, there was only one time I did really visit ICTP. That was when I was an MSc student and uh, it was in 2002 in the summer. Um, so, but hopefully, uh, maybe again in the near future, I will do a real visit to ICTP. Um, Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. I'm going to share my slides now. So I would like to keep it, uh, you know, interactive. So if you have a question, uh, type it out. If it's uh, something absolutely not clear, you know, you, you know, just I think you should just unmute and also speak. And that's, that, that makes it easy for me as well. So I have some plan uh, to cover topics, but I am not, I don't have to cover everything as so I just want to make sure everybody's uh, with me. Um, so the broad uh, goal of the three talks that I have planned is to sort of introduce you all to uh, bi-stability in ecological systems and, uh, and the role of stochasticity. How do we apply these models in the context of real data as well? So it's going to be a combination of theory and how do we look at real systems in the context of these theories that are sort of deeply uh, inspired by nonlinear dynamical literature, uh, nonlinear dynamical systems literature, okay? So the three part of my talks are sort of planned this way. So in the first part, which is today, I'm going to talk about what we call mean field approach. Uh, so I would imagine that you would have heard the word mean field in some talks throughout these last two weeks of fascinating talks. So I'm going to look at a mean field approach in this uh, first hour today. Uh, and how do we understand uh, ecological systems, those with bi-stability uh, using mean field approaches, okay? So one specific question that are the aim for today would be, can we predict? So whenever we have this bi-stability, uh, we have something called tipping points. Okay, now the question, the main question or the main motivation for today's sort of discussion would be, how can we use these main field approaches to predict or anticipate tipping points in ecological systems? So the second part, uh, which would be, I think next Tuesday, uh, it will be on you know the same question, but looking at spatial dynamics. Uh, okay, the real ecosystems are spatially spread spatially extended, uh, what can we do something better than what we do today, okay? And uh, the part three would be something more general, more interest, uh, equally interesting, hopefully. So, but you know, part three, uh, how much of that I will cover um, will depend on how much I'm able to accomplish my goals for the part one and part two, okay? So, so the main, uh, so let me, so this is the outline for today's talk. Uh, so the main motivation uh, to study bi-stability comes from uh, the idea of tipping points and abrupt transitions. So I will uh, provide that motivation, why we must be interested in bi-stability in ecological systems. I will then move on 
to describe simple mathematical theories uh, uh, of bistability and tipping points. And then I will introduce some mathematical techniques intuitively, you know, I, there will not be too many calculations and so on. Uh, and then how can we use these mathematical theories and intuition that we build to predict or anticipate tipping points in real ecological systems. And finally, the last part of my talk would be a discussion on and the demonstration of empirical evidence for these mathematical predictions. Okay, so that's the broad goal. And I'm, I, I understand that, you know, Carla Staver has already covered some aspects of, some examples of, uh, you know, uh, what I'm going to present today. Uh, so, so I hope there might be some repetition, some overlap. Uh, so please bear me with that if uh, it is, there is some overlap. But uh, to make my talk self-contained, I have assumed that you may not have heard her talk or you may not have, even have forgotten some of the details from her talk. Okay, so here is an example of, uh, you know, I'm going to give some examples, empirically documented examples of abrupt transitions in ecological system. So this is an example of a large scale abrupt change, large scale desertification. So what you're seeing here is the Northern Africa. Uh, if you look at uh, various proxies for vegetation in this huge landscape, okay, let me see, um, let me switch on the pointer. Okay. So if you look at this large landscape, if you look at proxies for this large landscape over last 10,000 years, you find that uh, preceding 5,000 years uh, before present day, uh, the vegetation sediments were dramatically different from what you see today. So this, this current phase, current state of Northern Africa, which is Sahara, which is desert, uh, was not always a desert. In fact, the sediments indicate that they were in an entirely different, different state of vegetation. In fact, it had a pretty uh, you know, decent level of vegetation in the landscape for several, for several thousands of years before it suddenly tipped and became the current state. Here is another example of the opposite type, and this is on a much more local scale. So what you're seeing here is not a continental scale, but really a scale of half a kilometer by half a kilometer area in China, where uh, over the last 60 to 65 years, the 60 year in this graph presents, represents 2010 also, uh, the grass cover in this area has changed. It used to be a low grass cover area, and then it has now settled down to a larger grass cover area. So this was an example of a restoration of grassland ecosystem. Uh, and uh, it has, it stayed in this low state for several decades before sort of switching and becoming a uh, moderately covered grassland state in the present day. Here is a third example of a lake eutrophication. Um, you know, data is obviously noisy from many, many ecological systems, but indicates some very interesting features. For the same amount, same values of drivers, you can have, you know, different values of the state variable. The state variable here is the sort of, you know, some measure of fraction of the lake surface covered by, uh, you know, vegetation. Okay. So what you see here is that, uh, you know, what uh, physicists would call hysteresis. When, when, when the lake underwent, uh, when the lake had a very high level of phosphorus concentration, so that's those are the red dots in this right extreme, and and uh, and a very low amount of the vegetation. As the as these forest values came down, it continued to remain in that state of low vegetation. However, it increased, and uh, and a reverse transition, however, happened for, across a different route entirely, different direction. So this is called hysteresis in the using the language of, uh, that is also used in physics and magnetic systems. Here is a, another example, classically cited as that of, you know, abrupt transition, which is that of stock market crashes. So where the stock markets often are in, even when they're in a, a very 
state of boom, there could be sudden crashes in the indices. That is uh, remarkable over a very, very short period of time. Okay, so sort of the, if I, if I were to summarize and uh, look at all these transitions uh, that happened, so they often are abrupt. They are abrupt changes in the state of complex systems. And once the change has happened, it's not just abrupt, it actually remains in that new state once the change has happened. It's a persistent change as well. And typically, they seem to have happened for no obvious changes in the driver values. So in every one of the example I gave, uh, no people don't quite know what was the driver that changed dramatically that could have also caused an abrupt change in the state of ecosystems. So, so the basic idea is that even for gradual changes in the known drivers, system can respond in an abrupt way. And sometimes these changes are irreversible. For example, if vegetation is lost, uh, if certain species are lost, you can not really recover them back. And uh, even when you can recover, uh, they could still be irreversible on time scales that human sort of you know deal with. So in uh, so in studying this now, you know, these are the empirical phenomena I have just described. We're going to hear a whole bunch of terms that which you may or may not have heard. Regime shift. So so many of these sudden ecological changes from one ecological state to others, they are also called regime shifts. They are also generically called abrupt transitions or tipping point events and more terms like critical transitions. So you will hear some of these terms, I will sort of clarify as and when necessary. Uh, stochastic transitions, because they're, they're often driven by a large amount of stochasticity in the drivers. And the mathematical concept called bifurcation, which I'm assuming you may be familiar now uh, with many, many of these talks and hysteresis. Okay, so I'm going to uh, use some of these terms and define them more precisely when necessary. Okay, so with these examples I showed you, this is the example of this large scale continental scale desertification. This is a relatively local scale recovery of a grassland and then a stock market crash. So what are the important questions that people in the ecology literature or people more broadly in the complex system literature are interested? Okay, so one is, you know, how do we mathematically model these systems? Okay, so do you build a very detailed process-based model to understand the systems? Yes, that is one approach. Or can we sort of develop fairly simple heuristic mathematical models that only captures essential details? The second question that people have been interested in, you know, can we really uh, have predictions for these kind of transitions? Uh, are there early warning signals before these transitions happen. So, I mean, if there were such warnings, then one can do something to stop these events from happening. So, for example, in this specific case, imagine hypothetically you were somewhere here, and if you had been given data from here to here, likewise, if you were somewhere before this dotted line here, you had somewhere here, let us say, if you had been given data, time series of cross cover, could you have anticipated this abrupt transition? Likewise, in the stock market, which of course has you know really huge applications. Okay, so so that sort of sets motivation for studying these phenomena and to study them, uh, you know, mathematicians, applied mathematicians, physicists, as well as ecologists, and many of them have you know applied mathematicians and physicists and ecologists. They have been using mathematical theory, theories of bistability and tipping points. So I'm going to describe those simple models uh, now and, uh, and see how we can model them and how do we to do, try to do predictions of these models. Okay. So, so here is a very simple model of ecosystem collapse. So here in, in this model, you know, you know, ecosystem is represented by a single variable. The ecosystem is really a large interacting system of species, right? However, one can think of ecosystem or you know sort of lump all of those into a single quantity called biomass density and one can think of you know how this biomass density is changing over time and what is the dynamics and the, and the simplest models 
of these ecosystem uh, dynamics have this concept called carrying capacity and an intrinsic growth rate R under carrying capacity K. And, uh, and in the, you know, uh, as long as this uh, intrinsic growth rate is R, R is positive, the, the, the biomass density V will reach a carrying capacity K over a period of time. This is also called the logistic growth model. Okay. Now, ecosystems are under constant pressure, not on, uh, both internally and externally. One such important, uh, you know, one such important process is that of grazing. Grazing could be driven entirely by uh, herbivores within the system. It could also be driven by livestock, that human settlements that are there nearby forests. And usually this is modeled as this, um, uh, sigmoidal rate function. So v squared divided by v squared plus v zero squared. This is represents loss due to grazing. This is a nonlinear term. Um, so basically, this assumes that uh, if the v is low, the the grazing rate is small. But if it increases, it increases nonlinearly and saturates to a value of c. So what is the what are the uh, equilibrium values of this uh, of this simple mathematical model of ecosystem. So equilibrium will be achieved when the logistic growth term will be equal to loss due to grazing. And if you calculate uh, the equilibrium points, what you find for some values of R, K, this is what you will find. So on the x-axis, the driver, which is the grazing rate, C here, okay? And y-axis is the steady state or the equilibrium biomass density. So what you find here is, uh, you know, when the grazing rates are low, of course, you will still have, um, you know, uh, for example, here I have chosen a value of k is equal to 10. So the steady state biomass density will be still close to the original carrying capacity. However, as you increase the grazing rate, that does reduce. But what is really interesting is there is a threshold value of this grazing rate. And once the system reaches the threshold value, the system will collapse into a low, vegeta, low biomass density state. And now if you do a reversal, it doesn't go back at the same point, but the system will stay in this low biomass density state before undergoing a transition back to a high biomass density states. Okay. So to understand these systems, uh, one can uh, think of uh, this simple intuitive picture, which is that of a ball rolling in a landscape. So what is this landscape? Think of x-axis on the landscape as, um, let me see if I can also write. Okay. Think of this as the biomass density eco ecosystem state. And uh, so wherever the ball settles, that becomes the stable state. So in this case, it will settle in this point or in here. So this is, a, this is a low biomass density state and a high biomass density state. And they both can coexist. And depending on where you start this ball, it can go here or it can go here. So this simple intuitive landscape picture can actually capture uh, how, the, how a system can have two stable states. So the one stable state is the low, uh, the, the deep well here. And the other one is a shallower, but a local minima here. Okay, so this is an example of what is called a bi-stability. Okay, uh, so you can think of ecosystem stable states as a balling roll in a cup or wherever it settles in this rolling cup or rolling landscape. Okay, and then, you know, there's also this important concept of basin of attraction. So, so anywhere, if I, if I drop the ball anywhere to the left of this line, right, we will have the ball rolling to this side. This is the basin of attraction for um, this a low biomass density state, and this is the basin of attraction for the large biomass density state. And then this leads to the concept of resilience, and because there is always a possibility that this ball will, you know, switch over to other minima. Uh, so how resilient is the system is a question uh, that's extremely important from an ecological point of view. So mathematically, how do we define this potential? It turns out that if we have a simple model where x, x basically is, uh, is a dynamical variable, you can define x by x, a simple integration 
of this rate function. You know, some x zero to x. So this function uh, is precisely what I have plotted in the previous graph to obtain this uh, obtain the potential landscape. So this potential landscape is not just an intuitive picture. For simple models, one can actually uh, mathematically uh, represent them as well. Okay, so uh, I'm going to skip some of those. So no, the, clearly this landscape picture is quite useful because we can think of minima as corresponding to stable equilibrium, maxima as corresponding to unstable equilibrium, and it captures features like hysteresis. You know, you know, and the fact that there is an initial condition dependence in these systems, and also that system, many biological systems are sort of you know irreversible, or you know, or they take long time to reverse once they are in another state. So all this can be nicely captured from this potential landscape picture. So one can also do the following. This was whatever I have been discussing so far is a deterministic picture. So what, however, what we can do is introduce some stochasticity to these models. So I'm calling them ad hoc stochasticity because I have, what I've done here is I have taken the deterministic mean field model and, uh, and then I have just added stochasticity, stochastic term to this. Basically here, sigma v is the strength of stochasticity and eta v is the uh, a random number which is drawn from a Gaussian distribution. And we also assume that the random numbers are uncorrelated over time. So we can you know, incorporate these kind of simple stochasticities and one has to be a bit cautious while doing so. Uh, for example, you want to ensure that the biomass density is never really negative. So I'm not going to go into those kind of technical details here. So, so what happens in, in when we introduce the stochasticity is we can now capture much more realistic features of dynamics. For example, here is an example of a vegetation system that is undergoing a collapse from a, you know, you know some some value of near the carrying capacity to a low value, and almost in this case, really. Uh, value of zero or close to zero. So this, this is an example of simulation where a system has undergone a tipping from a uh, you know, moderate or high value of vegetation density to close to zero. On the other hand, you can also have a scenario where the system will sort of you know, fluctuate between two stable states. You know, there is one stable state here, other stable state here, and the system can actually fluctuate between the two states depending on the uh, nature of stochasticity. So this is where I want to clarify a few terms here. So in this diagram, this is, also, this is called, sometimes called stability diagram, is also called bifurcation diagram. So in this bifurcation diagram, this point where the green branch is ending or this point where the black branch is ending, those are called bifurcation points or also tipping points and critical points in the context of nonlinear dynamical systems. Uh, and the transition that happen near this critical point, they are called critical transitions, abrupt transitions, and uh, if they have catastrophic consequences, we'll also call them catastrophic transitions. However, you know, these transitions can also happen um, when you are not necessarily close to critical points. Imagine you're really, this is a critical point, right? In this 2.6 in this specific case. However, if the system is somewhere near in the middle of this bistable region, so there is this region of bistability from values, uh, you know, close to you know, 1.5 to 2.6, if you are in the middle of this region, but however, the stochasticity, the external stochasticity is high, even then the system can fluctuate between these two states. And which means that even far from a tipping point, far from critical point, you can actually have, uh, you know, abrupt transitions from one state to other state. And these are called stochastic transitions. And what is interesting is this can actually take you back and forth. It doesn't necessarily take you to one side, it can take you back and forth. Okay, so remember these classifications, of course I will revise these. So there are two types of transitions I just mentioned here. One is that of, critical transitions or tipping point transitions. The other one is a stochastic transitions. So there's something that happens far from the tipping point or the critical point. Okay, so this provides, so whatever I have done so far is, you know, 
some a very simple mathematical model which has single variable and uh, and uh, it can sort of capture various properties of empirically observed phenomena so we had in the empirical systems we had observed abrupt transitions right we had observed hysteresis and uh, these two simple uh, empirically observed phenomena they can be nicely captured with this simple model of bistability so that's the point of the uh, my talk so far and then i have also introduced you to this concept of potentials and this was helpful to intuitively understand uh, uh, you know intuitively understand uh, how do we think of the dynamics so now can we go for you know one purpose of mathematics is not just to reproduce empirically observed features of course we do want to do that that's the bare minimum but can we do something more and something more in this context is can you provide can you predict tipping points can you anticipate tipping points can you forecast tipping points that's the question i am now going to address so uh, so for example in this context of bifurcation diagram let's imagine there is a real system that exactly follows this bifurcation diagram however we want to we want to know uh, we know that the grazing rates are increasing but i don't know if i am here or if i am here where am i is there some way of knowing where is the current parameter value okay that's the question that we are interested in now i just want to check if there are any questions at this stage so i'm sort of halfway through my talk today i have a question sure so uh, in that equation where you go to the equation slides sure so yeah yeah here here what is the functional form of v you always show a plot v versus c with some bi stability and s shaped curve mm -hmm. yeah so what's the mathematical functional form of v yeah yeah ha huh. uh, so basically v i don't have that with me right now uh, but you know if you set the condition for equilibrium which would be that you know this logistic term becomes equal to grazing term right you will have a cubic equation oh, oh, okay then from that bifurcation analysis you got yeah, plot okay exactly exactly yeah you set this and you get a cubic equation to solve you have of course mm -hmm. v equal to 0 is one equilibrium yeah and then you have a cubic equation to solve yeah yeah, yeah. and the, those are the roots of the cubic equation any other questions yeah and this is the mathematical form you assume but is it also common in real data that's an excellent question so these are you know um, you know sort of you know one can think of them as uh, somewhat like toy models they are uh, inspired by the terms that i have in included they are inspired by ecological processes but you know depending on the ecosystem that i'm thinking of okay uh, the exact terms can be dramatically different uh, so the question is how useful are they okay so so my answer so the one way to think about that is to go back to this potential picture any sorry if I, can we think of a, another bistable ecological system let's say i don't know the equation right yes, but, yes. Uh, but i know but i know the i know that the uh, the ecosystem has bistability as long as i can think of them in this potential well form okay no how do you know that your system has by stability you are given just a time series with some abundance or land cover data ha ah, but i showed you that it does show um, right you know it shows the abrupt transitions it shows hysteresis and both of these are consistent with the existence of by stability but that's 5000 year long desert time series yeah 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 exactly yeah yeah or i showed you several others i also showed you one grassland dig data right which is uh, much lesser in mean, like more like 50 to 60 years and then um, we also there are also many many more data sets you know i will show you some references towards the end uh, so obviously you know there is no one model that will capture all of those in one equation right so i am using sort of you know uh, what are called stylistic features and try to capture them using the models so the idea is not to cap you know compare the models with data directly but the idea is to compare the predictions and the sort of you know 
So with that, I know with the what happens in data. Okay. So let me go to the next part now. Okay. So, so the question I, we are trying to going to address now is, um, uh, you know, if somebody, ha, you know, if 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 you, if you had time series data, could you somehow tell I am far from this is the tipping point, right? This is the bifurcation point. Am I far from the bifurcation point, or am I really close to? Is there some way of finding signatures of that from the let's say time series data of the type that's available in nature. Uh, okay, that's the question we're addressing. So this is, uh, so what you now need to do is uh, look at these potential wells I showed you as a function of the grazing grade in the specific model I showed you. So for example, in this grazing grade, you know, we are quite far from the uh, critical point here. This is much closer to the critical point, right? Now observe this landscape features, which I have computed from the mathematical model. This is the landscape far from the threshold point. This is the landscape close to the threshold point or the bifurcation point, okay? So the landscape here has, you know, is symmetrical, right? It also is relatively deep. In contrast, the landscape in this case, right? Landscape where the ball is rolling is actually has two features. One is there is an asymmetric feature compared to this. It also is shallower. It's also shallow around the you know, uh, minima. So one can ask, do these features of the landscape, do they have effect on the observed dynamics of the data? So what I am now going to do is whether these two features, the shallower landscape in this case, and also an asymmetric landscape. How do these affect the dynamics of the ecosystem? If the model was right, okay? So obviously we're going to assume the model is right and we're studying within the context of this model. So again, I'm showing you this is, you know, far from the threshold. This is close to the threshold. And, you know, basically we need to think of this as, you know, this ball rolling in this landscape, what happens? So if you know, now do simulations of this model, uh, what you find is far from the threshold, uh, you know, this uh, the vegetation biomass, uh, of course, fluctuates because of stochasticity around the, around the minima. And so does in this case, closer to the threshold. But you know, one can visually compare these two time series and observe that there are notable differences. One is that in this case, the amplitude of these fluctuations are large. Right, and secondly, there are these, you know, sort of, you know, you know, uh, spikes that you're observing towards the lower values. In some sense, there are no analogs of that in this. You know, there is an asymmetry in the time series again that you are observing here, which is a consequence of asymmetry in this, uh, you know, potential landscape. Okay, so and so what this tells you is there is something about the dynamics that is fundamentally different between you know, these two values. One is that there's another point which I forgot to mention, sorry. You know, as you are, if you are in a deeper well as compared to a shallower well, the system will take much longer to return to the equilibrium if you are in a shallower well. If there was a perturbation, it takes longer to come back. And in fact, that again is quite sort of evident in this diagram. Just look at, you know, there was this perturbation here, right? And it does come back. And then observe the perturbations here. They are, you know, much more closely spaced. The, the return to the equilibrium value is much more faster. Okay. So what happens is because of the shallower potential, the system responds slowly to perturbations. And one can actually measure this from what is called autocorrelation function or the autocorrelation within the time series, autocorrelation coefficient. And secondly, because of this shallow potential again. The, the system now fluctuates a lot more around the equilibrium value. And because of the asymmetric potential, the, the system also, the time series also shows uh, increased asymmetry. So if you measure the ACF of time series, auto, auto regressive coefficient, if you measure the variance in time series, which the skewness in time series, all of them we expect will increase as system is going from you know, far away 
to the closure values. So let us plot this. Let me let me demonstrate this principle. This is a uh, very important principle. So here, what we have done in this simulation is the following: as the time is increasing, the, the grazing rate or equivalent parameter is being increased. System is going towards the you know uh, tipping point. The green line is the driver value. Note that the driver value itself is gradually changing. But the system is responding in an abrupt way here, right? It suddenly collapses at around thousand units of time. So, what do we expect if the if the the theory that I have shown you correctly is correct? What we expect is that if I were to plot autocorrelation at autocorrelation regressive coefficient, that should also increase, right? Likewise, if I were to plot the variance, that should also increase. And likewise, if I were to plot the skewness. You know, skewness is a, you know, is a value of symmetry. It could be positive or negative. Basically, the magnitude of skewness basically must increase before the actual collapse happens. So all of these must show these kind of trends before an actual collapse. So therefore, the idea is if you do observe these, maybe we are approaching uh, abrupt transitions or critical transitions. So in fact, uh, this is an example of simulation from the models. So the autocorrelation at lag one uh, standard deviation and skewness, they're all showing the expected trends. And these expected trends can therefore be used as, you know, indicators that I'm approaching a tipping point. Okay. So that's the sort of, you know, how we sort of use this mathematical models to make some predictions about systems that might show, uh, that might show uh, abrupt transitions. Okay, now here is the important thing. So although I showed you one specific model, one specific equation, and then and, and simulated and uh, analyzed all of this, the mathematical theory behind this is much more general. It only relies on the fact that the, the threshold point in ecological systems maps on to what is called bifurcations in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in our models. For example, these are bifurcation points, right? So, so basically, as, as you're going towards bifurcation points, these features are sort of universally observed. So therefore, although I have used one specific model, these trends that I'm showing you in this, although for this specific model, are likely to be true in a large number of cases uh, of abrupt transitions. So that's the theoretical <coughs> prediction, right? You know, if, uh, if a person is approaching, if an ecosystem is approaching tipping points by measuring these simple dynamical quantities, uh, you know, one may be able to anticipate that uh, you're approaching critical points or tipping points. Okay. So that brings me, okay, there is one paper, you know, for those who are interested, I, you know, in the statistical aspects of it, which I am not going to cover at all in this uh, paper, uh, there is a paper in PLOS one in 2012. There's also a toolbox that actually applies these theoretical principles and uh, provides you a statistical estimator of how good uh, can you actually measure these in real data sets. Okay, so I'm not going to go into details of this statistical aspects. Okay, so now uh, I have basically covered the mathematical theory of uh, tipping points and how we can use them to offer early warning signals. Okay, so now the last part of my talk will be, are they really true in real world data? Okay. So let's ask the following question. How do we ask this question? So how do we look for empirical evidence? Imagine if we had a laboratory system, if we can somehow subject a system to tipping point in a laboratory and then push that beyond tipping point, do you actually find the, those trends in the autocorrelation uh, values? Do you actually find trends in increasing variability? Do you find this warning signal before the transition happened in your laboratory system? That's one way to ask this question. Of course, in the, we eventually want to apply these to field systems. So, so for example, if you take data, long-term time series data, uh, and if you look at uh, that they have actually undergone abrupt transition. Did this system actually exhibit uh, trends that we have uh, predicted from mathematical models? So I'm going to address these two questions from, I'm going to show you what people have found. 
Okay, so this is a work by John Drake and others. So what they did was they uh, uh, did simple experiments where they uh, where they sort of grew back, you know populations of Daphnia in the laboratories. And what they also did was they subjected these Daphnia populations to increasing stress over time. Basically, increasing stress um, can be sort of you know sort of you know mimicked by reducing their you know, food uh, that's given to them. Okay, and what they do is they basically study them under also a controlled condition where they don't do it, and a condition where they are deteriorating their food supply over time. And what they do is they study four early warning signals in time series, variance, skewness, uh, and correlations in time. And what they do is because they had an empirical system, they were also able to estimate what is the tipping point? And in their experiments, they you know it's a year-long experiment. They subject these populations to increasing stress over time, over a period of one year, and they estimate that they reach tipping point in their in their in their in their data on day three hundred. And what they then do is they analyze early warning signals. So what I'm showing you here is coefficient of variation and skewness. What they find interestingly is this is you know, the dotted line here represents when uh, the tipping point in their you know in their uh, experiment actually happened the, the the small gray line in the bottom here that's the control data and what your the, the 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 one subjected to stress they are showing these you know much bigger trends so what they basically show is that they were able to find signals of the upcoming tipping point in their experiments almost 100 days ahead of actual tipping point okay and in fact this effect was most uh, visible among the four indicators in coefficient of variation and skewness and of course since then there have been more experimental verifications of these ideas for example in yeast population this is an example of yeast population density you know in sort of you know stable conditions and this is uh, the dilution factor again you know uh, mimicking stress and what's remarkable about this diagram is you know it looks almost like the mathematical model i showed you right it almost shows it looks like the bifurcation diagram of the mathematical model i showed you a stable fixed point unstable fixed point and another stable fixed point which corresponds to extinction and what they do in this again they subject these populations to stress what they find is that uh, the coefficient of variation, standard deviation, autocorrelation, they all increase. However, in this specific experiments, they did not find strong evidence for increasing skewness. Uh, so this is then there have been more experiments and uh, you know, uh, more other microcosm experiments. Uh, I won't be able to show you all of them, but the point is that you know, certain interesting features and the mathematical predictions are actually testable using experiments. In this case, okay. So, uh, so in the in the last part of the talk, what I am going to do is uh, to find empirical evidence for these early warning signals, uh, which are predictions of mathematical models, in you know in the field in the, in the data from field. So I spoke about I mentioned this uh, ecosystem in China, right, where there was a grassland restoration. Okay. So what they found what they found was that. Uh, there was this uh, low grass cover for about four decades, and then there is a high grass cover, which is the current state. And you know, intermediately there were these strong fluctuations that preceded before the actual transition happened. Okay, so what you find is that if you look at the histogram of this time series, it shows this nice uh, bimodality, and the, the typically the bimodality is a strong signature of bistability yeah, in the underlying system. So this bimodality in the data here shows that maybe the system is indeed quite stable. And uh, what we were also able to show in this paper was that uh, the dynamics of the system sort of dramatically changes around year 40 uh, using something called a change point method. Okay, so what we then did was, okay, now we know that this system has undergone this abrupt change in the grass cover from a low grass cover to a high grass cover. Did it exhibit early warning signals that the mathematical theory predicts? So what we did was we sort of drew this line uh, at which the transition happens, and we were only looking at data before that, before this year forty. 
And here we are, we are calculating autocorrelation at lag one, and we're also calculating spectral density ratio. So now don't bother with the spectral density ratio um, because I haven't described that to you. So what we find is that, interestingly, there is no evidence for this signature of critical slowing down in this data set. So one of the main predictions of the mathematical models, we did not find that to be true in this case, in this data set. However, if you look at variance, standard deviation, that shows a very clear increasing trend. Likewise, if you look at skewness, we again find a very clear increasing trend. So in other words, there is a very strong evidence for rising variability. But you know, if you remember, the mathematical theory predicts that all of these must actually increase, not only this. So, okay, but our data shows we rise only one of them to be true. So how do we really reconcile this? How do we explain the fact that there was no critical slowing down before the abrupt transition? However, there was rising variability. Okay, how do we explain this? Okay, so you know, this is where I would like to remind a slide I showed you long back, which is distinction between critical transitions and stochastic transitions. So critical transitions are those which happen at this tipping point or the bifurcation point. So your system is very close to the tipping point and then a small amount of noise pushes it down. On the other hand, you can have stochastic transition where the system is actually far from the tipping point, but a large amount of noise can kick it to the other state. So now what we did was we looked at uh, all the signatures for critical transition as well as stochastic transition. So this is critical transition, the sort of you know standard theory which I have presented so far. All of the four sort of you know show these signatures. However, if you have a stochastic transition where a large constant noise pushes system from one state to the other, you don't find any of the signatures. <coughs> Excuse me. However, there is a th second type of stochastic transition where the strength of noise is. Uh, actually increasing. If you consider this scenario, you do not find these two signatures. These two signatures measure slowing down of the ecosystem, slow response of ecosystems. However, you do find that the variance and skewness increases. And in fact, this is precisely what we found in our data. Our data does not correspond to critical transition, not to constant noise stochastic transition, but to the increasing noise stochastic transition. So therefore, what we conclude is that the dryland transition that we analyzed is a case of stochastic transition where there was no critical slowing down, but there was a rising variability. Uh, one slide that I have skipped because of time is that this rising, this sort of counterintuitive pattern is given by uh, you know, stochastic rainfall. The rainfall is increasingly becoming variable over time. That seems to explain this phenomenon. Okay. So I don't know how much time do you have now. I have about uh, seven minutes, right? Okay. So let me now present one more uh, such study we did to look at these early warning signals. So can we apply these tools to anticipate financial market crashes? So the, our motivation for this came from, uh, you know, many papers that look at uh, critical transitions. So for example, if you read this uh, uh, famous and classic paper by Sheffer et al. in Nature 2009, uh, complex dynamical systems ranging from ecosystems to financial markets and climate have tipping points at which a sudden shift to contrasting dynamical regime may occur. So basically financial systems are sort of often quoted as examples of tipping points. But is it, therefore, then are the predictions of tipping point models, are they valid? That's what we, uh, try to understand. Specifically, we ask two questions. Do we find evidence for critical slowing down, uh, which is basically increasing in the autocorrelation as markets approaches a crash? Do these markets exhibit increased variability prior to a crash? So what we did was we, uh, we took a, a data from a whole range of uh, stock market indices. This is an example of uh, uh, one specific uh, uh, stock market which is a famous Dow Jones index. What if what we know historically is that there are four well-studied uh, uh, crashes: uh, 1927, 1987, uh, 
1991 and then 2008 okay so what we did was we took each of these windows and we analyzed all the four metrics okay so here also what you find is that the autocorrelation at lag one which is a measure of critical slowing down has no clear patterns in fact as we are approaching as we are approaching uh, the crash it actually suddenly redu reduces so therefore there is no critical slowing down in this financial markets however if you look at the variance in time series that shows a very strong and clear trend so there is a rising variability prior to stock market crash downs okay this is not one market and one index we have studied we studied this for a whole range of markets and whole range of crashes in 1929 87 2000 2008 for all of them we find that the autocorrelation at lag one the critical slowing down doesn't show expected trends but the variance always shows the expected trends you know i don't need to do any sort of statistics for this and you can just see by eye that the fluctuations in the stock market indices are dramatically increasing prior to crashes and this is true not only for Dow Jones, we also found this for S&P, NASDAQ, and other markets as well. Again, how do we explain this lack of critical slowing down, but with rising variability? Again, I want to remind you about critical and stochastic transitions. In stochastic transitions, we don't find autocorrelation at lag one increasing, but we do find variance. So most likely, our data corresponds to you know, stochastic transition. The stock market data might correspond to stochastically driven transitions rather than the transition that happened near the bifurcation points. However, I want to highlight that there were also many, many instances of false positives. If one were to rely only on variance, there were also a large number of false positives that occur. Okay, so therefore, you know, one can't just rely on variance as a predictor. So it's only a tool that may provide some signal, but it's not a predictive tool. So therefore, we conclude even in the case of financial markets that they're not critical transitions. They don't happen near a bifurcation point. Their features are better explained by stochastic transitions. Okay. So, uh, so with that sort of, you know, I, I want to summarize the first today's talk, which is that uh, there are many, many in real world examples of abrupt transitions. And we mathematically model them as tipping points or bifurcation points. And you know, it's important to understand that there are these models can capture critical transitions which happen near critical points and also stochastic transitions that are strongly driven by uh, stochastic forces. Okay. And, uh, and these critical transitions, even stochastic transitions can have early warning signals. And uh, the, the two classic ones are that of critical slowing down, which is rising autocorrelation and increasing fluctuations measured by variance, QNS, and other metrics. And, uh, and we have, uh, we, there is no quite a bit of empirical evidence that these metrics may indeed work in real systems. And, uh, and uh, our specific analysis showed that stochastic transitions are better, uh, you know, many ecosystems and including financial markets are uh, probably thought of as stochastic transitions because there is a lot of stochasticity in these systems. They are not slowly going towards bifurcation points, but probably they are strongly driven by many stochastic factors. And this also provides an interesting case that you know mathematical models can not only explain and provide insights, they can also provide tools for the assessment of ecosystem resilience. For example, observing these metrics could sort of indicate to us uh, how close one is to, uh, you know, are we approaching um, low resilience states? Are we approaching potential uh, catastrophic transitions? Okay, that's a summary of my talk so far. Okay, so I will uh, take more questions now. And in the next, uh, the, the next talk on Tuesday, I plan to discuss more about the spatial patterns. Okay, and before I forget, and you know, before I take on question, I want to thank and acknowledge my collaborators. I started working with Professor Jayaprakash on these problems. And uh, I worked with uh, Nikunj and uh, uh, Srinivas Vagavent on the financial market problem and uh, uh, Chen Ning on the, in the grassland data. 
Okay. So thank you very much. So I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you, Ishwesha. So we have a couple of questions from the chat. If you want to. So how do I like, open the chat now? Um, should I close my screen sharing? By the way. Yeah. Oh, okay, I can open the chat. Okay, okay. We can also look at the chat down. Okay. So there's one question: Is the asymmetry and shallowness correlated? Um, uh, yes. Uh, so yes and no. Uh, so they are correlated in the sense that they happen simultaneously. Okay. Now, but they are but they are not happening by the same causal factor. So if I were to explain this mathematically, I so okay, I, I think I have a slide that may even explain this sort of mathematically. Okay. So if I look at if you look at if you think of you know classic and simple models of catastrophic transitions, so they have this you know linear term. Okay, let me see if I can switch on the Okay, can you see this? Okay, okay. In this equation, I have you know this bifurcation model with noise. There's this linear time term R times u, and there is this qubit term, right? So uh, the shallowness is can be entirely explained by the linear term, but the the you know the asymmetry requires you to use this cubic term. So you cannot obtain asymmetry without having a cubic term. And uh, so abrupt transitions in complex systems are typically modeled by saddle node bifurcations, right? And saddle node bifurcations does require you to have this cubic term. So, so yeah, so they are related, but they, they, they are correlated in the sense that they happen simultaneously, but the causal factors are different. And the second question I have is, you know, is it somehow related to curvature? Absolutely, yes. So the, so the shallowness is, is absolutely basically equivalent to curvature. So shallowness means reduced curvature, and that is what is causing reduced return rate to equilibrium. That is also what causes increased fluctuations. So they are all same basically. Shallowness and curvature are basically same. Uh, and the third question is uh, by similar question: Are some of the drivers more often correlated, or they vary largely case by case? Uh, before it's important to consider all. So yeah, I mean, I don't have a good answer for this question because this question, uh, one has to look at a specific system and try to understand what drives, well, how are the drivers placed? For example, if you were to think of a vegetation system, typically uh, rainfall and fire are very, very important drivers, right? So, so we need to know the mechanistics of the system to sort of Sort of you know address this question on a case by case basis and and in, in all of the model analysis i showed you uh, they were all assuming that a single driver is changing single driver is changing slowly towards the bifurcation point or the stochasticity in the single driver is what is really causing it okay the next question um, stock market indices are often flat tailed this leads to divergence of moments is it then meaningful to analyze the trends or trends? Yeah, this is a good question. You know, I'm not an expert on uh, financial stock markets, so uh, so uh, so I will not be able to provide a very very good answer to this uh, question. Uh, so my my own interest was you know more of academic uh, specific academic question since it is often used as an example of uh, tipping points. Does it, and we have really, very, very, really good high resolution and long term time series data. Does it show critical slowing down? Does it show the simple feature? Let's ignore the moments part. I agree. You know, moments are complicated. I fully agree. Uh, you know, even if you ignore the moments part that I showed you, uh, can we calculate the autocorrelation function and the properties of it, right? Uh, so I think that can be done without being worried about fat tail distribution parts. And we do not find evidence uh, for the mathematical prediction that there is a critical slowing down. And of course, you know, when it comes to so thinking a bit more about the fat tailness, I think that if you think of, uh, you know, uh, mean and variance rather higher moments, uh, you know, you to really observe divergence, you need a, you technically need infinitely large data. But we are obviously analyzing data for a finite window. So I think in that limit, uh, it might still be reasonable to calculate them. 
trouble to do drastic uh, transitions due to noise happen for specific values of noise? Is it a feature of stochastic resonance? So I think it is uh, related to, you know, uh, you know, you need a, uh, uh, um, so basically, you know, if you're, if you're the, the noise term in your model is a Gaussian noise term, right? Technically, the smallest noise can also cause, you know, transitions between two stable states, any small amount of noise. But, you know, you may just have to wait so long that it's meaningless now, right? But if you now say, okay, no, I want to observe uh, transitions within a given time scale, and I'm going to be interested only in those time scales. Yes, you do need a minimum amount of noise before a transition can happen. And in fact, that's the point that, in fact, my very first paper in my PhD thesis, I tried to address that uh, that specific question in a fairly, uh, this slide that I'm showing right now. So we basically, we, sh we in fact, we showed that assuming that the noise is bounded, uh, you need to have a minimum amount of noise for you to sort of, induce transitions and you need a minimum amount of noise to also to fluctuate back and forth. And I think it is related to stochastic resonance. You're right about that too. Yeah, there's one more question. Is it possible at least in principle to uh, amenable to account for feedback mechanisms? For example, rainforest sustains its own raining rate driver is not an external driver yeah so so i'm sorry that you know in this talk today i have absolutely not paid attention to mechanisms in some sense right i just used a model that showed the features i am interested in. uh so what uh, so what i'm hoping to do in the next one where i will discuss spatial models is that positive feedback mechanism is really important and uh, if you have weak positive mechanism weak positive feedback you do not have abrupt transitions. Only when you have a strong positive feedback is if, uh, is when you will actually observe, uh, you know, uh, uh, abrupt transitions. And uh, and in fact, it is precisely because of the positive feedbacks that you know two states. You know, in this slide, right? You know, there are two states, right? You know, the green uh, high vegetation state and the black low vegetation state. Um, you know, so the green line and the black lines they coexist because both of these forest states are stabilized by their own positive feedback mechanisms. And therefore, you know, it could be, for example, rainfall under a rainforest. It could, for example, be the, you know, uh, it could even be much more local scale. For example, uh, the presence of trees, a patch of trees will enhance the water infiltration that will in turn help the tree to go better, better that will in turn help a local uh, establishment of seeds and therefore the entire patch is sustained. On the other extreme, if there is nothing to start with, it's very hard to germinate a new seed because the water doesn't sustain there for long enough for a seedling to arise. Um, so so the, both the alternative stable states are often maintained by these kind of feedback mechanisms. That's a great question, thank you. Okay, I think we we had a, a rich discussion session, and uh, uh, we thank again uh, Vishwesha for uh, a nice lecture. Uh, now we have time for a short break, and we'll be back in uh, uh, about six to seven minutes uh, for next uh, for the next lecture by Andrea Rinaldo.